welcome to X is for the X Factor on the political trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is none other than Helen Cole, founder of the Gene Collective. The Gene Collective stands as a beacon of empowerment and advocacy dedicated to cultivating a landscape where every woman is equipped, encouraged, and empowered to assume leadership roles. Rooted in the belief that informed and educated women are the bedrock of a vibrant electorate, the collective tirelessly advocates for change, striving to forge parity in politics, particularly within the realm of municipal governance. Central to their ethos is an unwavering commitment to inclusivity and non-discrimination. The Gene Collective recognizes the and celebrates the rich tapestry of humanity, rejecting discrimination based on ethnicity, language, race, age, ability, sex, sexual orientation, income, political, or religious affiliation. Now, a key focus of the Gene Collective is the empowerment of the next generation of women. Now, at the forefront of the Gene Collective is none other than our guest, Helen Cole, a dedicated advocate for women's leadership and empowerment with a remarkable 35-year career spanning local governance and nonprofit sector. From serving in various capacities in Chatham, Kent, St. Thomas, Elgin, and Sarnia, Lambton, Cole's passion for community engagement has remained unwavering. The Gene Collective is not merely an organization, it is a movement fueled by the collective strength and determination of women. Together, they can champion change, dismantle barriers, and pave the way for the future where every woman can realize their full potential and contribute meaningfully to the fabric of society. So with that, welcome to the Political Trenches, Helen. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, that was very powerful and really meaningful to me. Thank you so much. I, I am so looking forward to this conversation. Ian and I have been chatting about this prior to recording, and it seems like your organization does tremendous work. But as the episode is titled, X is for the X Factor, I'm wondering if you can, with that description of what the Gene Collective is and your background, if you could for a moment, Helen, describe what is the X Factor? What is the factor that goes into making a good leader in 2024? Well, it won't be just one factor. Um, it's a blend of the several qualities. And for women in politics, there are some that hold special significance. For example, um, authenticity. It's so important that we don't try to be someone that we're not, that we show ourselves and so that the public feels that they can trust you. You need to be true to yourself and have a genuine connection to what your beliefs and your values are. Next, I would say resilience is so important. Politics can be tough. And for women, it can be even tougher due to a lot of systemic and societal barriers. So resilience is really key. I think that next would be strong listening and communication skills. It's very important that you are able to empathize with members of the public, whether you decide to run for office, perhaps you're looking at leadership roles in your community. So strong listening and communication skills results in effective communication. And that is just so important. Um, I think having a vision and a passion for what you believe in and your integrity, so important that you know what you stand for. Uh, there's a quote, um, but it won't come to me right now about, <laughs> if you don't know what you stand for, then you'll fall for anything, pretty much <laughs> is it. So when it's really important, whether you are making decisions as a leader in your community, or you're making decisions as a woman, politician, it's important to know what you stand for. 
and what your vision is. So I actually have a, um, a series of workshops where those are one of the workshops that, that we work through. <clears throat> and so we'll be talking about that, that in a few minutes here. But I, okay. I, I, yeah, we'll be talking about the workshops here at the end of the at the end of the interview. But I just want to take a moment and just sort of um, ask sort of a weird question, if you don't mind, before I throw it over to Ian. What skills and qualities you talk about empathizing, leadership, communication? But what specific qualities are essential for women aspiring into municipal governance? As someone who served on council from 1991 to 2000 in St. Thomas, Ontario, I can imagine you have seen candidates, councillors, mayors who have good qualities and bad qualities when they are in municipal governance. What makes, what skills and qualities are essential for women aspiring to municipal politics in 2024? The items that I mentioned earlier are certainly important. I would add to that that it's really imperative that you have a good understanding of your local community. You need to know what the community's needs, what their challenges, and what the community itself is, is looking for. It might be helpful to be aware of history and culture as well while you're making decisions. Um, again, the uh, leadership and the vision, I come back to that again. So if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So. <laughs> Those are the things that I think are important if a woman is um, looking at being running for public office. Just really, really important. You need to have a passion for your community. Why else would you do it? And, um, and I, I'm just going to throw this in there, even though you didn't ask. There is no other level of government where you can have the effect on your community that you can have at the local level. So I'm always, um, I've done a few candidate information sites sessions, and that's what I always stress. This is where you can make the difference. Anyway, I could go on. As I said, it was a politician at one time, so I'll stop. <laughs> All right. Well, I will take over at this point, too, and look specifically at getting women involved in local government. Uh, and of course, they're not 50, it's not even close to 50-50 in terms of either uh, mayors, wardens, right. councillors, any of those sort of things. But hopefully the trend is starting to move. You probably know more about that than we do. But what do you see as some of the most significant barriers to getting more women involved in or participating in local government in elected roles or advisory roles? Well, there is the fact that it's, it is improving, but in the past, we haven't had a lot of role models that we can follow. Um, as I said, that is improving, but that is one of the barriers. Um, women also are very hard on themselves in that they have expectations of perfection. They, they've got to be able to do everything just right. Whereas in public office, you're not going to know everything. And that's why you have staff to help and advise. Mm -hmm. But you you will learn as you grow. Um, when you are first elected, you are presented with so much information that it can feel overwhelming. But um, just relax, realize that you've been elected because Think people think you can make a difference, and you can. And so um, there is also expectations around a woman's leadership style. And it was a long time ago now that I was on council. But I did run into the fact that effective leaders were often perceived that they must be assertive, dominant, divisive decisive rather, if women leaders, it's a very fine line for a woman leader to walk because they're going to be criticized one way or another. But what we bring is different styles like collaborative leadership. 
And we do have to fight against the fact that our methods could be perceived or questioned, which can impact our perception of what our leadership should look like. Does that help you? Yeah, I'm sure there are some systemic barriers that are in place that need to be dismantled probably over time. You made a reference earlier to culture, for example, and mm -hmm. uh, that it's not something that we change overnight in terms of culture or expectations, but how do we get more, more, more women to decide to step up to that plate then? If we if you've talked about the, the attributes, we've talked about getting rid of some of the barriers, but how do we actually convince them that it'd be a good idea to stand up or step up and represent the community? What I've observed in the last few years is that women often think they can't do it. They may have grown up in a family where politics is discussed at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. They may have a deep political orientation, but still they think they can't do it. What I hear is politics. Oh, no, I'm not going there. I, I just don't know enough. I don't have enough knowledge. We continually sell ourselves short. Now, I'm talking to two men, so please don't take this as male bashing. But don't worry, man, I was about to mention that elephant in the room in about two seconds, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing a man would say, No, I, I don't know it all, but I'm going to learn as I go. So on our website, I've got a quote just about that. I'm going to try and I'm going to learn as I go. And that's something that women need to learn. In terms of barriers, there are a few. For example, um, the need for daycare. Now, you may be a single woman who wants to run for public office, but perhaps you have a challenge around daycare. Some municipalities have implemented a policy for not just for children, but daycare in general, because you could have an aging parent that you might need someone to care for while you're at meetings. But for women, that could definitely be a barrier. Um, changing the entire outlook toward women as um, politicians really, that really needs to change. And I'm actually looking at forming a team that would help in some of those areas around advocacy and encouraging women to take leadership roles or seek public office. Before I just I'm going to ask a follow up, if I may, do you see a role in there for the provincial municipal associations or the Federation of Canadian Municipalities? There is a lot of work going on with. AMO, Association of Municipalities of Ontario, right. FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, um, actually in all of them, there is a lot of, they're, they're actually really looking at that. And I have been part of some discussion groups around that because those organizations realize there is a challenge and we need to find a way to remove some of those barriers. So yes, do I think there's a role? Yes, I do. I have a very conflicting question I want to ask here. And I'm going to preface it by saying, mm -hmm. yes, I realize that we are the two white men in uh, who are leading this interview talking to, and I apologize for those who are listening, a white woman, a, a, a white a Caucasian woman. When you're dealing with leadership roles, the Gene Collective talks about the diversity, the sexual orientation. How important is it to open up the landscape to ensure that it's not just the traditional white working class mother who is getting to these leadership roles, but the single black female, the transgender woman, the lesbian mother of two who is going through, how important is it to for all women to support each other moving into this new world that we live in where women are being attacked on social media, they are being told not to do something because it's not their time. Are you seeing in your work, your line of uh, advocacy, more and more people, more and more women are just not willing to be put under that pressure of negativity that comes with women in leadership? 
I think I heard two things there. So I'll start with <laughs> well, welcome that. to the Chris Brown show where I ask about 12 different <laughs> questions and try to get to one. So. <laughs> so I'll start with the first one that I heard. Yes, diversity is absolutely essential. Uh, I keep working on that. I'm still learning how to reach out to different groups within each community to attract those who are not older white females. Um, we need that diversity in the community. And so that was where my head went when, when that, that first part. And then now I've forgotten what you asked me. <laughs> the, the, the next part is, are you finding more and more women not wanting to go into the realm of leadership roles because of the, and I, and I, I, I'm a big proponent that social media has been the downfall of our society. It is a place where people can just complain, uh, attack with uh, behind their screens. There's no name attached and people can just bitch. And I apologize and moan about what's going on in the world. Are you finding when you're talking to women in who are prospective leadership roles saying, I don't want to put myself through that. I don't want to put my family through those negative attacks that uh, comes with being in a leadership role in 2024. Yes. Um, that is because definitely... I can imagine the, the, the abuse that is today. And I, this is what's going to be my follow-up question. The abuse that uh, women in leadership are getting today is not the same type of abuse that you may have gotten while you were on council in the 1990s. You're right. Um, my abuse mostly came by phone calls um, because we social media wasn't a factor then. Or I can remember certainly one time after a meeting when I made a decision in a committee that one of my committee members didn't agree with and he threatened me outside in the parking lot. Um, and that was frightening and that can still happen today. But with regards to, uh, thank goodness we have integrity commissioners now, um, but with regard to social media, that is an issue. Some of the best advice I have heard from anyone, and you will know if you've looked at my website that I have a variety of interviews on there, and I don't know if it, if it was in the interview or if it was afterwards, but a very long time um, politician woman told me that the best thing a woman could do in terms of their social media was have someone else handle it for them. And I had a friend who ran for mayor recently and, and that is what she had to do. It became very... Um, it was it was not a friendly um, campaign. And um, so she had two young staffers that every day they went in and they took care of the nasties, if you will, on her social media. I think that I, if I were running, for sure, I would be doing that. Um, isn't it a shame, though, that a keyboard warrior can have that kind of power over you? They're they're too afraid to talk to you in person or to say, you know, I'd like to talk to you about this, but they're quite happy to attack you on, on social media. So my last question before I throw it back over to Ian here is because I feel like we've gone down a negative path. So let's turn back to the gene collective as a whole here for a second. Um, where did the Gene Collective come from? Because I, I was on your website. I I, I read. I I I I wrote. I I I read some of your writings that you've done. I read the uh, the background on the organization. But where did this idea come from? Was it something that you saw that you needed to a, ch a champion? Was it someone influencing you into getting into this type of field? Both. In two thousand and eighteen after the municipal election, when I looked across across Lambton County and I saw that we, I calculated it, we only had 20% representation in Lambton County. And I sat there that night and I thought, oh man, what are we gonna do about this? Well, I've been there, done that. I don't know, I'm not gonna run again, but maybe I can help other women. Maybe I can encourage younger women to run for office. That started it. 
And then I had a few women who helped me create it. And as I'm telling them one day about Jean McDougall, who lived in Port Stanley and was the single most imp important person in my life, she changed my life. My friend said, we should call it the Jean Collective. And it was born. And I, I'm so happy that I'm able to recognize her in that way. I thought about showing you a picture of her, but I think we don't need to do that. But we'll, anyway. we'll, we'll put it up on the old, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll put a photo of it as we're talking about it right now. So people can see what Jean McDougall looked like. Over to you, Ian. I will send you one. Yes. So Jean, um, Jean and I became friends very early in my political career because she was really interested in women who were making a difference and wanted to be in public office. And, and so um, you don't have time for the story, but I have to tell it anyway. She kept calling me. And so finally I went to visit. And the very first time I went out to her little cottage in Port Stanley, tiny little place, this tiny woman with white hair, pink sweats, and Birkenstocks opened the door to me. And her house was filled with newspaper. So because she read newspapers all the time and she had read about me, you know how that goes when you're a politician and you get reported in the local paper. So anyway, we grew from there to the point that um, I call her my heart mother. Aww. And <clears throat> she was very, very important to me. I'd like to change direction if I can just a little bit as we come kind of closer to the end of the uh, of this, this this line of questioning, and that is about trends and things. Are you seeing any trends? You, you talked about the twenty percent representation a little while ago. We've talked about some of the barriers that you're seeing to participation, but trends either in your province, in the country, or even international. Do you do you know what's happening in terms of getting more women involved? I am seeing more women um, getting elected at all levels of government. I think we have about 30 years to go before we reach mm -hmm. parity, however. Um, in 2022, I supported 20 women who were running for public office. And we definitely, I want to say we increased to 30% in 2022. We've definitely um, increased our representation. So. We're on the way. We've got more work to do. And and of course, I'm not going to be here forever. So I'm hoping that I can bring more people along who will help to keep this growing and will continue to support women in politics and in leadership roles. Are you getting interest from outside Ontario? There is some, but here's the challenge. Um, the rules are different. The so in terms of being very specific of public about public office, that can be a bit challenging. But here's what is the same. What I discovered is women didn't want to ask for money. Oh, I can't ask for money. And yet they were totally shocked at what the campaign would cost them. So they need to learn how to ask for money. A perfect example is me. Um, I have to call and ask people for money to fund my conferences. And every single time I pick up that phone, I hate doing it. And the old imposter syndrome rears its ugly head. Yeah. That's the same that happens with women who are running for office. So mm. they need to be stronger about asking for money. They need to develop their campaign. They need to know what their platform is, which then again takes you back to what their values are and what they stand for. I think I went beyond what you asked, but that's great. No, I'm I I cuz we we have uh listeners and watchers from coast to coast and beyond Canada as well and my suspicion is what you're talking about specific to Ontario is is not specific to Ontario. That is it's happening elsewhere in perhaps in the western world as well. So with that, I, I oh. hope that we can make a difference wherever in any province or country. 
so I, I want to talk about the future a little bit here because we are, like Ian said, we're coming to the end. And I, I want to ask you about two upcoming events that the Gene Collective is hosting. Um, you are hosting two upcoming leadership conferences to get more women involved. One on April 13th, which is being held in Wyoming, Ontario, which, yes, I had to double check was an actual place because I thought that was not a place until I Googled it. <laughs> and the second being held on April 27th in Ulmer, Ontario. And I knew where that was because I had the pleasure of sitting down with the counselor from Ulmer, Ontario, just recently. Now, what do you hope and what is the hope of the Gene Collective uh, for the takeaway of these two leadership conferences, one on April 13th and one on April 27th. Okay, takeaways. Um, increase, what, here's what we found from um, our September conference. And this is what I hope and I believe women will take away from the April conferences. And by the way, I start planning for a September one at the end of this month. I'm meeting with that group. So, and it will be September the 14th. But what has happened from our very first conference is that the attendees, the women who attend, are leaving feeling empowered and with additional conference. Because hearing from successful women leaders and understanding those pathways to leadership and political involvement does help to increase their self-confidence. The other was that the networking and the community building is huge. There are women who attended the conference in September who have become friends and are and and Catherine de Rogier that you interviewed, she specifically requested that some of those women who were at the September one come to the Elgin one because she just adores them. So it's happening. Um, <clears throat> By the way, I should say that um, though the women in uh, Elgin, the most fantastic group, the, I love these young women. I love working with them. They make me feel young. We have our <laughs> meetings in a restaurant with a glass of wine, and it's so much fun. So Catherine DeRoger, Rainey Weisler, Morgan, Morgan Halpin, and Sarah Emmons are on that committee. What It is so revitalizing to work with a young group like them. So in Lambton County, Tracy Kingston and Judy Crawl are my um, two important volunteers there, both people I've known for a long, long time. And... The outcomes of both of those conferences are, as I described, that women will feel they're part of a community, they'll make friends, they'll feel connected, and they'll feel inspired. The I, There were rave reviews from the one in September, so I'm recreating it to be very similar. I, 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 I can tell you that you do get rave reviews oh. because I had the pleasure of sitting down with a few of those names that you just mentioned. And they all said that your conference was very helpful in them in overcoming some of the challenges that they faced. Um, I want to oh. go ask though, because I am cautious of time, where can people learn more? Where can people get tickets? Uh, I'm assuming there's some links and we'll put them in the show notes, but where can people learn about some of the speakers who are going to be at these conferences? So I do, um, we operate on a shoestring. So um, it's all dependent on how much money we have for the conference. So what I, I use is website and Eventbrite. So there is uh, an Eventbrite event for both Elmer and, uh, sorry, for both Elgin County and Lambton County. And so they can register there. Uh, I, I, I keep the social media campaigns active, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, for example. And um, so, Digital media is primarily my way of advertising and ensuring that people know about the event. The other thing that is really helpful is if you can connect, and I try to, connect with community organizations. Um, the, the two chambers of commerce, the one in Elgin and the one in Lambton, for example, is a really good connection point. 
um, other community organizations, women's groups, etc. Podcasts like this are really, really helpful. So thank you very much. Do you have posters? Uh, we will put them up on our social media, on the Cross Border Interviews social media, and after this episode comes out. So check it out. Like okay. I said, to learn more about the Gene Collective, the links are in the show notes. So the links to the social media pages will be in the show notes. The links to the website for the Gene Collective will be in the show notes as well. Plus the two event right event links will be in the show notes as well. I highly recommend you check them out. And Helen, I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule and doing this interview, talking about what goes into a good leadership of women in politics and municipal governance, but also sort of the systematic barriers that women face as well. We wish you all the best in your two upcoming events, and I really hope they are a smash. Thank you so very much. It's my honor to be featured in this podcast. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity. My only question is, can I come back again?